Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 10th annual Boston Real Abilities Film Festival. My name is Katka Reshka, and I'm the festival director. And with me today also is my distinguished colleague, Ariana cohen Halberstam, who is the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film and has kindly agreed to co-moderate this conversation with me. And with us, we have the makers of one of the absolute highlights in our festival lineup this year, um, the film Not Going Quietly. We have with us producer Amanda Roddy and director Nick Bruckman. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. We're thrilled to be here. Yes, great. Uh, I want to start us off by asking you to, to tell us a little bit about this journey that the film had from what I believe was going to be a small political ad to this full length, full um, blown, amazing documentary that gets picked up by executive producers such as Mark and Jay Duplass and Bradley Whitford. How did this journey happen for you guys? Yeah, I'm happy to share that. So as you mentioned, in addition to making documentary films, we also um, direct and produce political commercials and not just political, but really progressive, socially oriented, social justice, marketing films and videos for both for big corporations and brands that want to change the world and also for social movements, for organizations, for environmental causes. And so when uh, Adi Barkin had just met Liz Jaff on an airplane uh, and confronted Senator Jeff Flake together, um, they decided to launch this campaign called Be a Hero, and the film tracks the launch of that campaign. Liz and I had a really close mutual friend in common, and she reached out to me and said, hey, we want to make a short film about this guy and this movement he's trying to start called Be a Hero. We're going to put it on the web and tell the story about how he spoke to this senator. And it all sounded intriguing, um, but also kind of sad and, um, I don't know, sort of somber, um, what, what was happening. And kind of this this plea for dying father wants health care but i flew out to meet adi in santa barbara and the interview i did with him was the funniest interview and the funniest conversation i'd ever had with anybody um terminally ill or not and adi was so resilient and spirited and such a fighter um that very first night basically had the initial conversation about what a longer version of his story might look like didn't know where that would go or where that would turn, but he was open to the idea because he had just had this massive media moment where his story suddenly was all over the news. And I think he was excited about the opportunity to tell it in a more profound way than just that one uh, moment in the, that everybody had seen on TV and on Twitter. I'm curious because uh, there's footage that's clearly from before that moment. Um, there's the footage of Adi in bed the day of his diagnosis, um, the footage from the day of his anniversary. Was he filming that on his own? And, and how did you come to incorporate that into the film? Yeah, it, it was amazing because in the process of making the film, we didn't realize that he had actually kept those video diaries until he shared them with us. And I think he had started to do that because he was diagnosed four months after the birth of his son, Carl. And he really wanted to create a capsule for him to remember himself by, which is another big part of the reason why I think he agreed to do this film with us. He really wanted his children to know who he is and why he did the work that he did and why he spent some time away from his family while his health was deteriorating to fight for a better country um, and to leave a better world for them. So yeah, he, he was filming himself, I think in part for his children and to understand what he was going through um, and how much he loved them. It's, it's I so love, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, so I just, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, you go, now you go. I was, I know, I just, I love that that footage came at the beginning because I think, you know, you, you start the film with, with Adi speaking, um, through um, this device and then we sort of take the journey with him. Um, so I, the incorporation of that footage at the beginning and then obviously using the footage that you shot later on, um, I was just wanted to hear a bit more about how you structured the film and how you thought about creating that story. Yeah, well, it was really important to show 
the audience, I think, where the story was going up front and to create a um, bookmark for who Adi was now before taking that step back and rewinding. The Adi losing his voice was kind of the defining, always going to be the defining arc of the film. And really it was the defining impetus for that first conversation that I had with him where I was interviewing him and he was saying that um, I need to, um, I've got a lot of time, I've got a lot, he says in the film, I've got a lot to say and not a lot of time to say it in. And that was always really resonant in that we had to move really quickly to get Adi to say everything he would ever say with his natural voice, which is not a challenge you usually have in documentaries, right? A lot of the time you go back and you interview all the key people and you ask where they were and tell the story again. And we couldn't do that at all with this film. Um, and so we, I think, wanted to bring audiences through the experience of knowing Adi the way his family did, the way his colleagues did. and. Um, and, but also teasing at the beginning where the story was headed and the kind of core um, irony of the film that as Adi's voice fades, he gets larger and his platform becomes more powerful. I think it's done really beautifully. Yeah, and Adi says at some point that, you know, the weaker I get, the louder I become. And, you know, it makes, it, you know, it made me think that it wasn't his voice necessarily that he was losing, but just his ability to, you know, speak using his vocal cords. Uh, what was it like for Addy to to watch that, um, you know, to watch this this process of losing his ability to speak um, like we do? I think um, as much as I can speak for him, he's mentioned it before. I think um, I think it's really difficult. I think it's difficult also for his his family to relive that. Um, the reality of it was really difficult. Um, and I think, you know, every, every moment we were aware of the fact that every interview that we were doing with him, every Verity scene we were capturing, um, that's, that time was incredibly precious to him and his family. So we had to be very careful about how much we filmed and um, we really had to make sure that we weren't capturing more than was necessary or needed, um, which was definitely a, a big challenge as Nick mentioned. But yeah, I think, I think the real truthful answer is, um, it's hard. I think it's it's difficult for him to to watch that progression again. Um, and although he's in a good place now with his health stable, um, and he has twenty four seven care, um, and he could live another decade, two decades, five decades, um, th that process I think was 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 devastating, um, obviously, and um, it never gets easier. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you show, the film shows so well how social movements affect, affect structures of power, but also how one person, single person can, can actually do to, to change the world, you know, while losing his capacity to do, perform basic tasks in, in, in life. But you do this in a way that, you know, doesn't create inspiration porn or, you know, a party. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges in trying to achieve that effect? Yeah, that was really important to me personally. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really grateful that the film has been well received so far by the disability community. There are several um, disability rights activists in my family. And, and the last film I did had disability at its, at its core, although it was about immigration, but I think it's an issue that intersects with all other issues. And, and um, you know, really, is a kind of litmus test for a functioning democracy that that takes that is, is a way that I see it. And I think it's very, um, even though the film is not, I would say, and Adi doesn't consider himself necessarily to be first a disability rights activist. Um, I think it's at the core of um, you know who we are as a society in terms of uh, the rights of the of people with disabilities. And so. Um, we obviously wanted to be careful of that. There's an inclusion of a scene with another gentleman who has ALS um, who acknowledges that trope um, and Adi acknowledges it himself. Um, of course, Adi is inspiring um, and that's uh, just one of the ironies that he has to deal with in the film even though he doesn't like it and, and, and folks with disabilities often don't like that. So I think the best we could do was to acknowledge that that trope exists and that in a way it could be it could be minimizing or it could be marginalizing to be an inspiration. Um, and so we tried to just put that front and center in the film. It's not, it's not his duty. It's not the duty of, 
uh, people with disabilities to inspire others. It's, it's the responsibility of all of us as a society and democracy to afford opportunity to people um, who are marginalized in all kinds of ways, whether it be by disability or, or socioeconomic status or racial justice, um, at least in my opinion. And I think hopefully this film talks about the intersectionality of those issues. Um, one major kind of turning point in the film is when they move uh, sort of out of the healthcare arena into the fight against uh, the Supreme Court nomination of, of Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And that fight begins about healthcare, but ultimately becomes about sexual violence and the accusations that are levied against Kavanaugh. And that was really important to me to include in the film because it shows that the film, I think at its core is not just about healthcare or about disability, but about the power of storytelling to shape movements, to build power and to create change. And you see that when Adi first tells his story to Jeff Flake, you see that when Adi takes sick and disabled people around the country to confront their representatives. And then you see it in a totally other arena when all of these women um, come to DC to tell their stories of sexual assault and those stories become this tool for power. And as a documentary filmmaker, that idea of telling your story to create change is like the meta uh, microcosm of what we're doing. And so that was like, to me, I think, I hope that's something that really comes across in the film, um, not, just, not just the individual issues, but the, the way communities can, can create change. I think it totally does. And I think one of the things um, that really comes across to me about Adi is his ability to sort of pinpoint an issue and then get behind it um, and transition as, as needed, telling, um, allowing the story to, to shift to the story of sexual assault because that was the, the advocacy that needed to happen in that moment. Um, and even in the way that, you know, at the beginning of the film, he says, you know, the healthcare was, the losing my um, body was hard, but the, the even harder part was uh, dealing with healthcare. I mean, th that language there is really powerful and you see how he sort of moves into this movement. Um, and I will shy away from saying inspiring, but I do think it, it is, and, and, and not because, obviously not because I as a person with a disability, but because um, of the work he's doing and has always done. Um, and I think that's maybe an important distinction. Totally. Yeah, I think he's accomplished so much in such a short period of time that it it just has to be inspiring. Um, and it's also a little bit intimidating. Like, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's a workaholic and he's done so much and uh, will continue to do so much that um, he's definitely someone who I look up to a lot and will always. That, that's the thing. Eddie doesn't actually seem to be taking it easy <laughs> no. either. <laughs> you know, no. he continues to be active and involved in just about, you know, everything that demands action or an opinion. <laughs> totally how you know I guess how tempted are you to continue to follow him with the camera or you know is someone else following him with the camera is the question <laughs> that yeah. is a good question we are um we are doing more new video work with Adi um currently not in the context of uh, a sequel although uh that is in the cards I, I like to say that Adi's best work is almost certainly ahead of him I think we captured, I hope we captured the early days of his activism. Um, we also joke, you know, one of the things we couldn't show in the film is um, a lot of the work he did leading up to what happens in the film. All of that we condensed into about a minute in the movie, but Adi had a decade long career of activism before ALS. We felt the most important story here was showing how he transformed this diagnosis into a tool to support the work he was already doing, but there's a lot more angles to it. And I think for people who want to know more, one. Um, great thing that they can do is pick up Adi's book. Um, the process of him making it is in the film as well called Eyes to the Wind. Um, but I'll just mention briefly that Adi right now is engaged in um, a variety of uh, activism work around um, Medicare for all, both on the national and on individual state levels. And so we are doing some video storytelling with him and the Be a Hero team that we hope the film and, and that work can uh, support each other and, and help uh, in this year do what the what Adi does in the film, which is get politicians elected and then hold them accountable. And is he still working together um, with the same team with Liz and or has he moved on from that? Yeah, they're still working together um, and adding more members to the team. So they're growing and still doing the same work um, and taking on new issues too as they um, inevitably crop up. So that's another thing that 
you know, I really loved about the film is that you you actually included a whole number of love stories in the film. And, you know, one of them is is Addie's relationship with, with Liz Jaff, his partner in crime in activism. And then Addie's best friend, who's, whose name escapes me, who's, you know, who's, who, the scenes with him are so beautiful. And, you know, it's, I mean, we should all dream to have friends like, like this. Um, and then of course, Addie's relationship with, with his wife, Rachel, and, and, you know, last but not least with his, with his kids, Carl and, and Willow. Um, you know, how did you, how did you um, make decisions and how much to include of all of these relationships and, 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 you know, and how to prioritize what you, what we see? Yeah, that was definitely the hardest part because there's so many amazing people around Adi, um, certainly his wife, who's an amazing academic and was really more part of the bio hero effort than we were able to show in the film. Um, certainly his best friend, Nate, we filmed many, many hours with uh, that, that hit the cutting room floor and, and the history of their relationship is really beautiful and they were activists together when they were younger. Um, so those, those elements were really tough, but we, I think, wanted to show on the activism side, it was really important to include other voices beyond Addie's, like uh, Ana Maria Archila, who's in the film, and Tracy Quarter, um, who are um, real, not only like close friends and colleagues of Addie's, but also the people kind of bearing the torch and carrying the work forward and, and will. Um, and then also, of course, his personal relationships, because I think what the film is about and what Adi's work is about is showing how the political is personal. Um, the film and his journey launches with telling Senator Flake, asking Flake to explain how, he, how is he going to explain this bill to his three-year-old son. And I think, um, you know, the movie opens with, with uh, Congressman Jim McGovern saying that his son is going to be proud of him. And I think the rest of the movie is about Adi's journey to make his, his son proud. And the way he does that is by making the world a better place for him. So I think that motivation of the relationships you have with the people you love in your life and connecting that to activism as a joyous celebrity uh, community communal act that you do as a, you know, a love in public is justice, right? I think is the quote around that. And so that I think is how we tried to approach and think about the political and the personal and balancing those two in the film. And that was really the hardest part in the editing as you rightly pointed out. You well, mentioned at the, at the end of the film, there's a note that his work shifted a little around coronavirus. Um, and I think that activism, you know, we all sort of see the need for major changes over the past year. Can you talk a little bit about how that work shifted and what he was doing around, around coronavirus? Yeah, I know that they were they were working to get PPE to nurses, especially. Um, they work a lot with um, the nurses union, and that was a cause that they took up. Um, you know, pressuring the government to provide more funding and more PPE to nurses, especially during the height of the pandemic. So that's something that they did and raised a lot of money for um, in order to get those protections to nurses. Obviously it was a massive fight. So they, they did their part and they, they really were able to get um, a lot of uh, protective gear to nurses. But um, as we saw, it was, it was a majorly uphill battle at the time, um, which has only gotten slightly better now, but not, but not much. Um, so that, that's another fight that they took up right during the height of the pandemic, um, which was amazing to see too, because, you know, it was right after um, a lot of a lot of work around the election or during work around the election that they've decided to pick up that fight. So um, yeah, they definitely had their plate full. I would be remiss to, to, to not ask about what it was like to have the Duplas brothers and Bradley Whitford uh, on board for this for this film. Uh, I know, you know, I, I heard a little bit of the story about how uh, Bradley Whitford and Addie had a bit of a, a run-in at a rally, and so that's a, that's a, you know that's the best way to start collaborating together. Uh, what was it like to get uh, the Duplass brothers on, and can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, it was it was awesome. We were introduced to them through Bradley. Um, Bradley and Addie, like you mentioned, um, 
met during a protest um, and quickly became close friends. And Adi actually officiated Bradley's wedding. Um, I think it was last summer now or two summers ago. Um, and so when Adi and Bradley were chatting, he mentioned the film and Bradley came on board pretty quickly. He really loved the initial cut that we had, um, obviously was a huge fan of Adi and asked us if he could share it with um, Mark and Jay. And then we were like, of course, um, and they watched it. And um, I think we're also taken by Adi's story and signed on board. And they've all been incredible partners to us and they've provided us with a lot of creative guidance. Um, I think we didn't imagine them having, you know, a ton of time to spend with us, but they really did carve out a significant amount of time to watch cuts. We went to their offices um, and they provided some creative guidance and, um, really supported us along the way. So it obviously was a, an immense benefit to have them on board and they've been really gracious with us. And you're doing the festival rounds now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's next for the film and how people can tell their friends to see it? Yeah, definitely. And I also just want to add um, that a few other, we were really lucky to have a few other executive producers on the team as well. Um, the uh, Sam Bisbee and uh, Jackie Bisbee at Park Pictures, which is a really um, amazing production company here in New York, and they give us a lot of support. And um, also Nina Tassler and um, Denise Denovi at Patma Productions, and that's a actually quite legendary operation. Denise Denovi is a Hollywood producer of some of the uh, great uh, films from from the last twenty years that you know. And and um, we were really lucky that people responded to the footage. Um, None, none more than Bradley, Mark, and Jay. Um, and that helped us make it because it's really tough to get these independent documentaries off the ground. And they saw that this could be, I think, more than a, a medical story. They saw that this was a, a really cinematic and narrative experience. And they're all real master storytellers who make narrative Hollywood movies. And that's the quality that we wanted to bring to this. So they were really all the right partners. Um, and yeah, on that note, we. Um, have been on the festival uh, circuit with the film. We um, are really uh, glad to be playing both in New York and Boston, and I think also Toronto Real Abilities Festival. The, um, there's a, a wide variety of distribution plans that are gonna be announced soon after that. It will be coming uh, to a theater near you in August. And the best way to get details on that is to follow us on social media. You can sign up at notgoingquietlyfilm.com, put your email in, and you can uh, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And maybe you guys can throw those links uh, to our social things into the YouTube or wherever wherever this gets posted, because it's, it's really helpful for us to start building that audience now and making people aware. And that's, that's what this is all about. And how can people find more about, we definitely will do that. And how can people find more about what Adi is doing now and, and follow his organization? Yeah, you can go to beaherofund.com um, and that will take you to all the social media links you want and need. Um, and I would also highly recommend following Adi Birkin on Twitter too, because he is very active there as is his team. And I have done that, and I absolutely <laughs> recommend that everybody that everybody do this. It's 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 really it's really remarkable just how active he is on 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 Twitter, and uh, I just I just keep getting notifications about Eddie Barking activity. So it's it's really fantastic. Um, are you guys in touch? How how are they doing? And you know, in the pandemic, what is what is happening for them right now? Other than of course, Adi, you know, being as politically involved as humanly possible. Uh, how's his family doing? Uh, we only really, you know, see uh, the second child, Willow, come into the picture towards the end of the film. Uh, what has it been like for for the family to have? You know, it's been it's been really really positive, and in, in that um, you know they get to um, have full time care in the home, which is something that developed recently and later in the course of the film. So they're really able to spend more time bonding. They've got amazing caregivers um, that uh, we worked on a, another film just about his short film, just about his caregivers because they're so important to the story and couldn't be included. And um, the Adi was really vulnerable to Corona. Um, and of course he's still vulnerable. Though we're really happy that he's just gotten his second shot as you saw on Twitter. Um, but it's, um, you know, folks with disabilities are um, really on the front lines of this pandemic and are, are amongst the most vulnerable and I think one thing that's 
so connected about what we've been through over the last year since we finished the film is that everything that's happened, I think, really proves the thesis that Adi is making, which is that the health of the most vulnerable amongst us affects the health of everybody. And that's certainly what we're seeing with the pandemic. It doesn't, but it's not just the pandemic. It's every layer of our healthcare system where if we don't take care of the most vulnerable, it's going to affect everyone. And that's what um, is going on politically. Um, and yes, Amanda, you can give more updates on the kids. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's my favorite thing to do. They're um, so cute. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, uh, Carl and Willow are great. Um, and Willow is, um, will turn two in November. Um, so she's getting bigger. She's got a full head of hair, um, even though she's born with one pretty much. And um, yeah, uh, Rachel and Adi were saying that Carl and Willow's are um, very close. Carl's a little bit uh, rambunctious and rough with her, but she's kind of um, rolling with the punches and she really loves her big brother. Um, and I think the, the two the two of them bring Rachel and Adi so much joy. And I think um, they're, they're super grateful to have welcomed Willow into their family um, as well. And they also credit the fact that they're incredible caregivers who provide 24 seven care for Adi um, are kind of what enabled them to have that extra capacity to have Willow. Um, so they're all doing well. The caregivers are doing well. Rachel and Adi are doing pretty well. Um, and yeah, the kids are the kids are great. That's that's fabulous. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, ALS Therapy Development Institute, who are our community partner um, for the screening. Um, please um, follow Adi Barkan and the film, Not Going Quietly, on social media. Uh, you can find out a lot about, uh, about both. And um, Not Going Quietly really is one of the highlights in our fabulous lineup of films this year. You can stream all films nationwide through May 13th. Please support us on our 10th anniversary this year by making a donation. And we hope to see you during our live programs. Many thanks, be well, and as Adi Barkin would say, be a hero. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. It was an honor to be here. Best of luck at the festival. Thank you. I loved your film. It was really um, great to get to meet you and speak to you. Incredible. Thank you Thank guys. You. Awesome. Keep in touch, you guys. Thank you. All right.